again, welcome back, and uh, I hope uh, you enjoyed lunch and, and, our, and the remarks by the Under Secretary General. <coughs> so thus far, we've heard from a panel on uh, strategic communications, some of the challenges in peace operations, and the second one on best practices. Our third panel will look at innovations for strategic communications, um, moving the strategic communications frontier forward, and is chaired by Mr. Sven Eric Soder, General Director of the Folke Bernadotte Academy. Sir, over to you. Thank you very much, and uh, welcome back from, uh, from the lunch and uh, to our last, uh, last panel. Uh, as was said, we have, uh, during the morning, had two panels, one on challenges today and another one on best practices. And right now, in this last, the third panel, we are going to focus on how can we move the Stratcom frontier forward. Uh, but uh, personally, I have, in different capacities, worked with communications and, and Stratcom. And I have learned over the years that uh, it is uh, very practical to, uh, to uh, base communication on, uh, on solid knowledge, of course, uh, but also to try to learn from others and to see what is best practice. So, if you forgive me for a minute, I would like to do some uh, public relations for an upcoming publication from the Folke Bernadotte uh, Academy, because we are right now in the process to put together a very practical and very handy, we think, communication advices handbook to be used in the field in peace operations and in crisis management uh, operations. And uh, our aim with this um, handbook is to uh, create a sort of a toolbox for communication professionals. And uh, we try as much as possible to draw lessons learned from uh, both the United Nations, uh, the European Union, also the African Union, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, and uh, the, the NATO. And also from uh, what we can call field journalism. And uh, this handbook uh, deals with topics, topics like media relations, mm. uh, crisis communications, and the importance of social media in this new communication landscape we have, and we have talked about earlier uh, 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 today. And uh, hopefully this handbook will be uh, uh, published uh, later uh, this year. But let's turn to uh, to uh, our panel, and this uh, uh, imminent panel I have here beside me. And uh, some of the questions that we have asked uh, our panel to consider include, what tools can the UN draw upon to effectively communicate both internally and externally? What are the platforms that the UN peacekeeping should target? And what tools does it need to do so? And how can the UN secure a position at the forefront in this important evolution that is strategic communication? And uh, to my left here, first we have Stephen Dreyer. Uh, Stephanie, sorry, Stephanie Dreyer. It's my dad. <laughs> dad. <laughs> Stephanie Dreyer, sorry. And uh, Stephanie is director of digital media and strategy uh, at the office of the Secretary of Defense. Public Affairs Department of Defense, United States. And as the Director of Digital Media and Strategy, Stephanie develops the messaging and content strategy for the US Department of Defense digital media platforms, including all the department's social media challenges. She recently launched the first Facebook page for uh, the Secretary of Defense to help Secretary Carter to better communicate his priorities, both to the force and also to the American people. Stephanie was previously also the communications director of the Truman Project and the Center for National Policy and served as its on-the-record spokesperson. She has also been the spokesperson and public affairs director for Groove Energy, Biofuels Advocacy Group, and served as deputy press secretary for U.S. Senator Charles Schumer. Left to uh, uh, Stephanie is Mr. Peter Gio. Peter is uh, president of the Better World Campaign and Vice President for Public Policy and Advocacy at the United Nations Foundation. 
Peter joined the Better World campaign in 2009 and leads the campaign's strategic engagement with Congress and the administration to promote a strong US-UN relationship. He also serves as the Vice President for Public Policy and Advocacy at the UN Foundation, and Peter has over 20 years of legislative, analytical and management experience, including senior roles on Capitol Hill and in the State Department. He has worked on a broad range of foreign policy and foreign aid issues, leading in negotiations around repayment of U.S. areas to the U.N., being part of the U.S. delegation to the climate negotiations in Kyoto, and successfully also leading negotiations for the landmark HIV, AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria act of 2003. And to the left of Peter, we have Mr. Daniel Stoschaffer, who is the president of ICT for Peace Foundation from Switzerland. And Daniel is a former ambassador of Switzerland and the founder and president of the ICT for Peace Foundation, which since 2003 explores the use of information and communication technologies, ICT for peace building and crisis management and humanitarian aid, and supports diplomatic processes for peaceful and open cyberspace. And as an ambassador of Switzerland and special representative of the Swiss federal government, Daniel was responsible inter alia for hosting the UN World Summit on the Information Society in 2003. Daniel had also worked in the Swiss federal office for foreign economic affairs and in the Swiss mission to the EU in Brussels. And prior to joining the Swiss Foreign Service, he worked for several years in the UN based in New York, but also in Laos and China. So as you can hear, we have a very skilled and experienced uh, panel here. So without further ado, I give the floor to Stephanie, please. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. Uh, I hope that nobody has a food coma going on. <laughs> we'll try to keep it interesting. Um, so uh, as Sven said, I'm the Director of Digital Media and Strategy for OSDPA, the Office of Secretary of Defense. And this is a brand new role uh, for DOD. And the role was created to address a lot of the challenges that have been discussed here today. Um, obviously, we all know that social media is uh, huge, right? It is um, more prolific than uh, traditional journalism in some, in some areas. You know, in the past, right, we had policymakers sitting around in rooms thinking of policy, and then we would have events like this, and journalists would come and cover the events, and that's how we would get our news. But now, anybody with a smartphone can be a journalist. And this creates a lot of opportunities, right? There's this opportunity for two-way communication. There's this opportunity for crowdsourcing. Um, there's also a lot of disadvantages to having everybody uh, have a microphone. So although I'm not a peacekeeping expert, um, I have a lot of experience in digital media, overseeing a very large uh, government agency with strategy. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit today about uh, you know, how digital communication can help uh, the UN embrace uh, the 21st century. So uh, specifically, I'm going to talk about three things. The first thing I'm going to talk about is digital uh, communication strategy as media strategy. Uh, the second thing I'm going to talk about is audiences and platforms. And the third thing I'll talk about is some new tools and what are the advantages and disadvantages. So I think that um, based on the panels that we had today and, and the, the lunch uh, where the undersecretary is speaking, everybody understands that embracing 21st century communication methods that are now standard practice elsewhere is critical if you want to be relevant in today's fast moving world. So you know the DOD was a little bit slower than other government agencies when it came to the digital media game, but we've made fantastic strides just in the last year. And uh, part of that is because my current leadership understands this idea that digital media strategy is media strategy. And what I mean by that is that I, I worked, I've worked in traditional communications, as you would say, for about a decade. And in that time, we've seen social media explode on the scene. And many people were very hesitant to embrace these new technologies. And so what ended up happening is you would see the social platforms being run by the youngest person in the room, or in some cases, the intern. And while that may seem like an easy answer, the truth is that your social media strategist has to have a seat at the table with your traditional uh, strategist for communications. They, they need to be able to work hand in glove with your traditional communication tools and, and personnel. 
Um, so, you know, when I was interviewing for my current position, that was the first thing that I asked uh, the people that I was interviewing with. You know, am I going to have a seat at the table? Are people going to take me serious, right? When I'm sitting in rooms with, you know, four-star generals who don't understand what a Twitter feed is. And fortunately, um, my, my leadership, they made good on their promises. And so they've allowed me to be in those strategic meetings, and they've allowed me a lot of room to run. And so in the last few months, we've really uh, started to streamline our strategies, and the DOD uh, is, in my opinion, <laughs> doing a lot better in terms of communicating with our audiences. So we use social media to showcase the amazing work that our service members and their families are doing. We also use it to communicate with our stakeholders, which includes veterans and policymakers. And we use a number of different platforms to do this. At DOD, we use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Vine. We also have a Google Plus account. Um, but we tend to focus on the platforms that work best for us. And we know that because we did the research. There are studies out there that show us that among uh, military families, 93% uh, of military families use Facebook. That's compared to 67% of civilians. Four million people on Facebook are veterans or active duty members. 13 million people on Facebook are family members of a veteran or an active duty member. So this is obviously a great platform for us to be using when we want to communicate to the force. And that was a huge reason why the Secretary of Defense decided that he wanted to go on Facebook. So we told him these statistics, and we explained to him that, look, sir, if you want to talk directly to your audience, you want to talk to the troops, we're going to put you on Facebook. Because there is no way that we can have you visit every single uh, service member across the world, but we can create a sense of accessibility by putting you on Facebook. And so after his 100 days, we launched his Facebook page. It's facebook.com slash secdef, if you want to take a look at it. And we use that in conjunction with our DOD Facebook page to showcase what he's doing, to push his priorities, and to make sure that the force can stay up to date with what he's doing and what other service members are doing. So I think that it's really important, if you're going to think about using platforms like Facebook or Twitter, that you know that your audience is on there. Identifying where your audience is, where they go to get their news, is going to help you define the platform that works for you. Just because Pinterest is really popular doesn't mean it's the right platform for you. And you know, it means that you might have to make some tough decisions. Uh, we just recently, um, sorry, for years we had something called the Pentagon Channel, which was a 24-7 uh, television station that broadcasts around the world. And we were spending a lot of time and resources filling that content. And you know, with the proliferation of technology and on-demand services, we noticed that we were talking to a diminishing audience. And so last month, we decided to get rid of the Pentagon Channel. And we are now throwing those resources behind our new digital media platforms. We're trying to teach our um, you know, tech sergeants how to do 30-second videos instead of 30-minute videos. Right? When we put, when we, actually, this year, when we do the Secretary's 4th of July message, we're not going to have him sitting in front of a, a flag just talking to the troops. We're going to do something a little bit more fun, something that's more designed for a uh, social media audience. So, you know, making those tough decisions is going to allow you to focus on the platforms that are going to work best for you. So, there are lots of tools out there that I think that the UN can, uh, in, you know, invest in. Um, and there are many reasons why they should do so, right? On the, just from a positive perspective, right, social media creates accessibility and the news streaming opportunities. UN peacekeepers are deployed in some of the most dangerous conflict areas around the world, but new technologies can help them monitor <laughs> conflicts, carry out early warning, and maintain situational awareness to identify threats and support proactive peacekeeping. So obviously, there are a lot of platforms that you all know about, right, Facebook, Twitter, they, there are live, live streaming opportunities, but there are new technologies out there as well. There's a new technology called Yik Yak, uh, which is basically, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a tool which allows people to anonymously create yaks, which is basically like a post, um, to, and to a, people within a 10 mile radius. And so all users have the ability to contribute to the stream, you can write, you can post, and then you can upvote or up down a post depending on whether or not you like it or you want it to be seen by more. So this could obviously be used, this type of technology could be used by peacekeepers who want to easily monitor conversations in a smaller area. In addition, I just read about this new app called Jot, which is a messaging app that works without a data plan or Wi-Fi. So it's actually targeted at tweens and teens who don't have access to their, their data plans when they're in school, but they have access to their, their um, like iPods. 
and so they can talk to each other without data. And so obviously there are a lot of areas around the world that do not have the best internet accessibility. These kinds of technologies could really help enhance the communication efforts uh, in that area. Also, social media obviously creates the opportunity for transparency. I am not in any position to disclose our strategy to degrade ISIL. However, our audience really wants to know what are we doing? What are we doing every day to go after these guys? And so what we started doing is we started to get video from CENTCOM of basically strikes on ISIL. And these videos are not that great. They're, they're grainy. They're literally, you know, they're one, one shot of a, of a missile coming in and hitting a, a bus or a car or whatever it is, wherever the target is. But every time that we put these videos out, we get more than a quarter million views. We get positive reinforcement on our page. People are you know, volunteering their unsolicited advice about how we should go after the terrorists. Um, and it's not to say that we are taking that advice, but well, the point is, this is the, unless it's a good idea, right? But my point is that this is essentially a crowdsourcing opportunity, right? We're showcasing what we're doing without giving away uh, you know, the too many details. And we're you know, um, keeping a positive, putting a little bit of a positive spin, right? Because this is. As, as I said in the earlier panel, right, ISIL is very good at using social media uh, for propaganda purposes. Um, and so that actually actually gets me into a little bit of the disadvantages, right? So just as we use social media to bypass the traditional communication pillars, so do terrorists, right? Social media plays a, a major role in disseminating ISIL propaganda and getting new recruits. And you know, in addition, there is a risk that as you put out live updates about attacks or violent episodes, uh, if you pinpoint them on maps, for example, um, you know, hostile parties or looters can use that information to their advantage. And so what I would caution is that it is really important that there is a balance between how much you put online. And it means you have to be careful about who posts, when they post, and what they post. Um, you know, specifically because social media is in real time, when there's a crisis, there's a desire to just get out there in front. And I think that that's the right mindset, but it is very important that we don't respond without knowing all the information. So I, I heard this really great stat earlier. Well, it's not a good stat, but the stat is that there are 148 UN public affairs officers to more than 120,000 peacekeepers in the field. So that means that you have one PAO to every thousand uh, peacekeepers. And that, that can be tough, right? If you're trying to disseminate information to 1,000 people, right? So it means that you have to be really clear about who has the information? Who do you give it to? If you're going to put talking points out, make sure that the right stakeholders have access to those talking points. And there's nothing wrong with putting out a post. Let's say that you know, your Twitter gets hacked. There's nothing wrong with putting out a tweet that says, we are aware of the situation, and we will update you when we have more to tell. Right? That means that you are admitting that there is an issue, you recognize that there is something that has to happen, but you're not responding without the proper information or without talking to the right people. So again, don't get caught into this um, cycle where social media means you have to go you know, right, like that. You do have time to take a minute, gather the troops, and get out the right message. So one of the first things that I did at DOD in this role is I created a social media crisis plan. And your social media strategist should work with your communication strategist to create that. And it will identify who needs to be contacted, who gets out there in front of the camera, and what gets put out. So I think that, um, that, that you know, there are a lot of lessons uh, to be learned from DOD and other agencies. Um, but I think that in the end, it has to be a targeted uh, strategy for the UN. So identifying the right platforms, identifying the right audiences, and making sure that you're using the technologies that are going to work for you. Um, the last thing I would say uh, is that it's really important that you have strong passwords and two-step authentication. That's just my <laughs> PSA for the day. Um, and yeah, bottom line, I just think that if executed correctly, the advantages of social media far outweigh the disadvantages, and the UN should dive headfirst into more dynamic communications efforts that will support the mission. And that's my spiel. Thank you very much, <laughs> Stephanie. <laughs> thank you very much. And please, Peter. Great. Well, uh, thank you very much. And thank you, uh, Sven Eric, for uh, chairing the session. And uh, um, it is a pleasure as well to appear with uh, Stephanie and Daniel. Um, and uh, I'm Peter Yeo with the Better World Campaign. And our job at BWC is to create a stronger relationship between the US and the United Nations. Uh, we were created by Ted Turner 15 years ago uh, when the US owed a billion dollars in past dues 
to the UN for peacekeeping. Uh, and he was, in typical TED form, pretty darn angry about it. Uh, tried to give a billion dollars to the UN itself, and uh, that was not workable from a legal perspective, and created the United Nations Foundation and the Better World Campaign instead. So our job is to work with Capitol Hill, the executive branch and the media, and civil society to create the strongest possible relationship between the USU and the UN and make sure that American policymakers appreciate the value in working hand in glove with the UN as a partner to tackle some of the most important global uh, challenges out there on the development front, the economic front, the strategic front. And foremost among them uh, is uh, peace operations. Um, I did want to pick up on a point that Stephanie uh, made at the beginning of her presentation, which is a digital media strategy is a media strategy. Um, we feel that strongly at the Better World Campaign because from our perspective, so many of our supporters, so many of the people that we work with, not only uh, around the country, but also in the executive branch, on Capitol Hill, and in the media, are, are getting as their primary source of news from a digital channel. So if we're not reaching them digitally, then we're not doing our jobs effectively. Um, and as a parent of a 22-year-old son and a 16-year-old son, I know where they get their news now. Their first exposure to any news is on Facebook. For my 22-year-old and my 16-year-old, his first exposure to news is he'll see it on Twitter. And that's the reality. He's not going to see it on CNN.com. They're going to see it on their social media digital platforms first. So we need to go to where they are as opposed to hoping to that they're going to read some press release that we're going to send out. So it's core to what we do, and it's core to what our ability to get our job done. Um, you know, the peacekeeping issue is always a challenge in the U.S. context because we are the largest financial contributor to U.N. peacekeeping at, at the moment more than 28 percent and going up as we approach the end of the year. Now, you know, a percentage is a percentage, but, you know, $3 billion, which is the U.S. share of U.N. peacekeeping each year, is a very large and sizable contribution. And... Uh, so, from a, the budgetary perspective, as Congress looks at this issue, they look at $3 billion and think that's a large chunk of money, as they should, because these are taxpayer dollars that we're sending to the UN to enhance peace operations. Um, I'm really pleased that for the past six years, the United States has fully paid its dues to the United Nations, and not only paid its dues to the United Nations, but made up for $1.5, $1.6 billion in arrears that had accumulated at the end of the last administration. So over the last six years, because of a variety of um, initiatives, we have been paid up um, to the UN. So, but the only way this happens, the only way that we pay our dues, the only way that we make sure that Americans understand the value of working with peace operations, working through the UN, is by telling the UN story that peace keeping story from an American national, perspe national perspective on foreign policy uh, and a national security basis. And so let me tell you just a little bit about how we view strategic communications and digital platforms as allowing us to tell this story. Because if we don't tell this story, we know for a fact that lawmakers will prioritize other areas of foreign affairs spending. The members of Congress are bombarded with messages, fund this, fund that. And uh, unless they hear not only from advocates here in Washington, but from their constituents, they will fund other priorities. And um, you know, we can go to the Hill as much as we want and say that the US is legally bound to pay these uh, peacekeeping assessments. But really what matters is making sure that Senator Schumer and other members of Congress hear from their constituents because as cynical as we all are about members of Congress, their motivations, and I worked on the Hill for 22 years, I get it. Nobody loves Congress. I mean, every time somebody complains about how unpopular the UN is, my response is, if you looked at Congress's approval ratings right now, I, I think the UN is the least of your issues there, um, in the low 50s percent, I will note, uh, which is way above Congress. Um, but the, um, the end of the day, so it's easy to be cynical about Congress, but members of Congress are listening to their constituents. We see it all the time. We see it in lobby days where the members of Congress want to meet with their constituents, are listening, 
and are reprioritizing what they fight for because of what they hear. And our ability to effectively harness digital is absolutely essential to re reaching members of Congress. And we see it increasingly when members of Congress are tweeting themselves. Now, sometimes they have their staff tweet. A lot of members of Congress tweet themselves, which means that when you tweet at your senator and you tweet at your member of the House of Representatives, guess what? They're going to see it. They see that message. And that's an important thing. When, and from our perspective, we're not only making sure that we're using digital uh, platforms to reach members of Congress when there's a problem. When they do something right, first thing we do, we go to our constituents, please, Use social media, use digital platforms, let your member of Congress know that we appreciate what they did because they've got to hear the thanks. If they don't hear the thanks, they won't do it again. Um, and so the biggest way that we do this is through our annual Thank a Peacekeeper campaign. Now, from our perspective, Thank a Peacekeeper is designed to remind Americans of the essential bargain of UN peacekeeping. You know, we have enormous control because of our veto power in the Security Council, there is not a mission that's created or ended or its mission changed without active American support. So we're, in a, we're, we're one of a very small group of countries that have this, this power. We also don't contribute troops to UN peacekeeping missions. There's no more than 100 troops, American soldiers, participating in UN peacekeeping missions, which is a statement about uh, the bargain, which is that we pay the dues. We rely upon other countries to become troop contributing countries, but we at the United States, a wealthy country, pay 28% of the dues. That's the bargain. That's what Thank a Peacekeeper is all about. So through our Thank a Peacekeeper campaign, since we've launched it, we've had 130,000 Americans sign digital um, postcards, which uh, our friends at the UN help deliver directly to UN peacekeepers, and then our friends at the UN will do videos uh, with uh, the peacekeepers having received the thank you cards, expressing their gratitude to Americans for supporting them in their work. Um, and again, that sort of feedback loop is very uh, helpful in terms of the success of the campaign. Um, it also allows us to reach a younger audience. We frequently now go to model United Nations around the country with our thank a peacekeeper helmets, and we find that students are more than happy to participate in this campaign because it's something they can understand. They're already in Model UN, so they know what the UN is. If they're in Model UN, somebody's taught them about peacekeeping. So it's a captive audience, and we're going to them with a fairly simple advocacy ask, which is thank a peacekeeper for their contribution. So as a result of this effort, we've had 45,000 young people take part in Thank a Peacekeeper that are not part of the Better World Campaign, United Nations Association family, who are using digital platforms to tell their friends about the importance of peacekeeping and how it serves not only American but global interests. So last year we decided to take it to an even greater level to try to get more young people involved, and so we ran a contest where we asked students to submit uh, various entries to explain peacekeeping from their perspective. Uh, my favorite was Georgetown students who um, did a comic book talking about uh, peacekeeping. Then we had some middle school students from Washington, D.C. do a video about why peacekeeping serves American interests. We brought them to New York as contest winners, and they helped present uh, the Thank a Peacekeeper uh, um, uh, helmets uh, to the United Nations in a ceremony. Um, so we fundamentally believe that as we think about strategic communications, we think about our digital platforms, that it's absolutely essential. But frankly, there's a lot of fatigue. There's a lot of noise out there. You know, you, you experience this all the time as you probably communicate to your own troops. They get bombarded with messages. So how do you reach them? How do you get them to open and read what you have to say? So this year we tried something new. We got five former presidents well, fictional presidents. They played presidents on television. Uh, Alfre Woodard, um, uh, Jimmy Smith, Michael Douglas, Tony Goldwyn, and uh, Bill Pullman to do a video thanking peacekeepers. Uh, and just within the first three weeks uh, of launching this video, we got a half a million impressions, and we uh, surpassed all of our previous uh, records for number of actions during that period of time because we were offering something new unexpected, different. And that's absolutely essential um, you know, when we think about effectiveness in digital communications. Uh, it is a very crowded space. Uh, and in fact, 
you have to be short in how you communicate with people. If it's long, nobody will read it. Um, and so our most common uh, shared uh, item on the UN Foundation blog is the 10 facts on peacekeeping. It's been shared 11,000 times, and it's because it's an infographic. It's 10 things you probably don't know about peacekeeping. And so when you break it down in that way, it allows you to use the digital platform, not only so that people share it on their own you know, smaller networks, but what are the advantages for us about bringing the five former fictional presidents into our family and doing videos is they all agreed to push out the Thank a Peacekeeper campaign to their entire network. And all of these stars have hundreds of thousands, millions of people in their various social network, whether it's Facebook or Twitter. So, you know, as we think about digital communications, it's also not an end in itself. We are advocates. We're trying to influence policy. So, yes, digital communications, tweeting at your member of Congress is important. Tweeting at the president, sharing at Facebook, all important. We're trying to move people up the advocacy commitment curve. We want people to get used to talking about peacekeeping so that they're willing to take the next step, which is to send a letter or to do the next thing, which is do an in-district meeting with their member of Congress, or to do the next thing, which is come to Washington and participate in the lobby day, or do the next thing, which is become a champion and train others how to do this. So our goal is to move people up. Digital media is like heroin. You know, it's, it's a good taster, you, you really like it, you get used to it, and then we reel you in. And, um, and we find that it works incredibly effectively to try to uh, move people up the constituency commitment curve and make them even better advocates uh, for UN peacekeeping. Um, and I just want to end on a point that uh, Stephanie raised as well, which is the importance of transparency. Um, you know, I think that that's one of the best things that social media has done uh, to uh, all of the uh, peacekeeping missions deployed throughout the world is by having social media presence, it allows them to explain in real time to people uh, in the country in which they're serving and to supporters around the world what that peacekeeping mission is doing and the challenges it's facing. And I think that, that the use of digital media by the UN, uh, uh, by the UN in a peace operation setting um, has great potential to increase transparency. And with greater transparency, there's greater confidence in what people are funding. So thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. Thank you very much, Peter. And now I give the floor to Daniel, please. Thank you. So, good afternoon. Thank you very much to the organizers for the kind invitation to participate in this very important uh, workshop. Um, on, I will talk about more from a maybe policy diplomacy, procedural how, uh, way or uh, how to bring the UN into the 21st century and help move forward uh, in this uh, strategic frontier. So before I do that, allow me to say a few words about ICT for Peace Foundation, um, which of course is not, let me see if I get that right, uh, known to many of you maybe. Uh, the ICT for Peace Foundation is a think tank who does research, advocacy, and it's a brainchild of the World Summit on Information Society. Maybe some of you remember, we have some colleagues in the, in the audience who have been very actively involved in these processes uh, in 2003 and 2005. And in 2003, we were very worried uh, about uh, the digital divide and that developing countries would be left behind. Uh, so ICT for development was a very important uh, topic. And then when we moved to Tunisia, to the summit in Tunis, some people came and said, how about peace? Couldn't we also say mutatis mutandis, we can use information technology as we use it for business or health or for education, also for peace. And it was that reason that some leaders like Marty Atisari uh, asked us, convinced us, to do some basic research which uh, is contained in this paper, this uh, report, which was then finally published in 2005, 
uh, and which led then, uh, and here comes my, my diplomatic background, in this paragraph 36 in the Tunis commitment, which we feel, uh, and at, that, at that time, you have to understand that ICT was still, you know, sort of in very early days and not uh, so evident and ubiquitous as we have it today in all life. So we were able to get this paragraph where you see ICTs can, as a tool, help those people who are in the business, if you allow me, for early warning, prevention, mediation, post-conflict, reconstruction, peacekeeping, peace building. So this is uh, the story, the beginning. And then we had this paragraph that said, you know, it's all good and nice and so, but uh, what are we going to do about it? And one of the first uh, areas that we said, I mean, it's a huge field, and, and so we said, let's look at crisis, crisis management, which sort of, and define it man-made or natural, so you have peacekeeping, you have also humanitarian operations, and um, how ICTs can help in this particular field. So uh, I will talk about how the work that we've been doing. And the second field, increasingly cybersecurity, uh, became important because if we want to use this fantastic internet and web and all these tools, we have to have an open, free, and sustainable and trustworthy uh, space. So that's why we then, uh, uh, in 2007-8, and then uh, leading uh, 2011, increasingly got involved in this space and called for a code of conduct for responsible beha behavior, state behavior. We started with policy research uh, to accompany the emerging uh, consultations, negotiations at, at the UN and elsewhere, and also, of course, um, trying to enable members uh, of developing countries and the, to be participate in this increasing space. This is just to show you another area of work that we are deeply committed and which is sort of supporting the first area, which is crisis information management. Now, um, we have talked about this high-level report, but I think we should also look at this particular report, which came out and which uh, the Under Secretary General mentioned, out of which um, a lot of recommendations are coming out in the field of technology, information technology very important, and therein, uh, of course, they also talk about strategic communications, and we have seen uh, texts of that, uh, but he also talks about crisis, uh, information management as such in crisis, uh, and that's why we see, and it has been mentioned by some of our colleagues, um, uh, Yasmina, I think, also, that uh, when we look at internally and externally, there is a symbiosis of the work we're doing in terms of strategic communication, but also as what we're doing in crisis information management. And by that we mean really uh, how is, for instance, in a peacekeeping mission or in a humanitarian operation, how are we collecting data, information, and sharing it for better decision making uh, and protecting and reporting and we feel these two areas uh, are linked. I think you cannot do strategic communications if you talk with your colleagues who do information management in crisis, in a peacekeeping mission, and you all know uh, how many civilians, police, and, and, and military components there are in a mission, and then the country team. So if you don't talk to them, you cannot do effective strategic communications. So that's, uh, we have been internally thinking a little bit how the future could be, what would be sort of the terms of reference um, in a mission, peacekeeping mission, but I would broaden it because often now we have hybrid situations, we have peacekeeping, but we have also humanitarian operations and you have humanitarian actors. And um, so we have to develop terms of reference or uh, what we could call digital blue caps, as my colleague who put this term, that can do information management, but also be, be public information officers. I think, again, uh, the tools that we have been describing, both categories, 
of people have to leverage them, have to understand these platforms. And because in both cases you have these two-way communications and tools and you have to understand it uh, uh, and to use them for both purposes. Um, so we have to rethink in a mission what are the roles and responsibilities uh, of an information management or strategic communication officer. So the training that we have to do, and we talk about that maybe later, is really you know, needed to understand these tools and uh, the pitfalls and the challenges and, and the noise and how to, to you know, separate the chaff and so forth. So this is very important. So we have to create in these missions new in institutional uh, architectures to, to carry out our, our job in both internally and externally to generate data and to push it out. So um, maybe this is a little bit uh, going too far, but um, we have to really get um, a new way of Carter that uh, can enable them to be able to counter even some of the narrative uh, and disinformation and, um, and to be able to, to, to um, you know, get rid of some of the wrong information and get a, a good message out as we have been discussing this day. Now allow me a little bit, and I think it could be interesting for this because, because of the linkage of crisis information managers and strategic communicators and see what leverage or lever we could have within strategically, diplomatically, but also from a process point of view. Um, in 2008, the Secretary General appointed for the first time a Chief Information Technology Officer at the ASG level. And he, uh, one of his first tasks was to us, ask us to do an, in, an inventory of tools and practices in terms of crisis information management. And we wrote a report, and which was, of course, sobering, 2008-2009. Um, but while doing so, we were able to talk to all the organizations, the UN family, from UNHCR, WFP, DPKO, DFS, UNDP, UNICEF, etc., how they do, and how do they share information when they go into a mission. And of course the report was sobering, but then we had the opportunity to have them together and build this crisis information management advisory group, which then collectively built uh, the first strategy, crisis information management strategy of the Secretary General the first time, which sort of should help as a, as a lever again um, to bring about uh, a crisis information management strategy that deserves this, this word and basically um, has this, this vision. Recognizing the need for credible, accurate, complete and timely information for managing crisis the United Nations, working collaboratively with its stakeholders, strives to improve situational awareness and crisis information management capabilities to protect people, human dignity, environment, basically the UN mission. Based on uh, that, um, the strategy was developed and has basically four components which is so high level but so, so strong that all of these uh, different organizations could subscribe to. Very important first is the data architecture, the data governance. What data actually are we need to share for each particular crisis, even in each particular peacekeeping operations? Define what's the data that we are sharing, what's the technology that we're going to use. And there, of course, we know that these technologies are changing fast uh, every, every six months. And uh, so we need some capabilities to follow that. The UN needs some capabilities. Then who is involved? Who are the stakeholders? Now we know that even victims produce data, information that you know, we can use. And then, of course, capacity building. So we are uh, implementing this, this, this strategy is being implemented and has, of course, these uh, outcomes which should lead to increased effectiveness, impact, and so forth. Uh, while we were doing that, and now uh, you know all that, we have been... Um, new tools have come about. 
So an additional sort of challenge to the organizations who tries to, to bring itself together, harmonize an information management strategy, has now to its disposal these new tools, which of course we now is history. Uh, and, um, but the organization has to take into account. So a crisis information manager or a strategic has to look at this new breakdown of data and information. Before, uh, it was just the SRG who sent out his staff to look and report back today these uh, uh, information managers or analysts who have to produce information to the, to the SRG for decision making has to look and master all this. In, with regard to the, 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 the data architecture, there is uh, surprisingly still um, a lot of work to be done. For instance, very basic information for about each country is, is not consistently available. So we're still always confronted where you know, organizations come in a country and ask the same questions. Fortunately now, um, the UN has been um, in, uh, making some progress in using uh, technology to enable organizations to share data more easily uh, and so new technologies come about. But still, a lot of data, a lot of information is produced outside of the UN and the UN has to be, find ways and means to, to get in touch and obtain information from groups uh, like crisis mappers who have been you know, providing a lot of information for the first time in Haiti uh, and now on a consistently, consistent basis also in other crises. And there are now new communities like the Digital Humanitarian Network that will be able to provide data information, for instance, now again in, in Nepal or in other areas. So this is positive development. We have also been able to, to work with uh, uh, peacekeeping operations and support uh, DFS to go into a particular mission and talk and discuss how, for instance, a mission can develop a uh, data architecture and uh, within the mission having military police and, and civilian components and even try to see how they can work with the country team in each country. And uh, so at the same time, we were able to provide some training course on how to use new uh, technologies, new media, and so forth. So uh, we feel that, uh, lastly, that training is extremely important. And um, so we have developed a training course, which we call Crisis Information Management Training Course. The first ones were uh, executed in, with the support of, in Egypt, uh, but now we have uh, done it in several places uh, for peacekeeping operations, again to introduce and how we could master uh, new media in, in the mission. This having said, I think we still have a long way to go. I think, thank God, we have now these reports who recognize the challenges and the opportunities and we will use these reports uh, how we can push forward, the frontier forward. But it's still sort of below the radar screen. Not enough money is available for information management. We have heard um, um, from, from, your, from our colleagues. And so we are working very close, uh, hard and close with some member states like Sweden and others, how we can introduce more money on a consistent basis into UN operations, peacekeeping or humanitarian operations. These are the things that are cut first if money is very low. We have some progress made uh, quite recently um, that now even in the budgetary process, in the fifth committee and so forth, based on a report by the Secretary General, uh, more uh, recognition is given to this area and p potentially more fund funds and that uh, there is a mechanism now how uh, the Secretary General and the Secretary is doing in terms of improving crisis information management. Something which is also still missing is when we look at peacekeeping operations and others, we're not looking enough how we're doing in crisis information management. And I think there also some, some work is to be done 
um, with the uh, competent uh, organizations in the UN, then also there must be a capability how the UN can follow this fast-moving field. Uh, and um, so there, uh, I think also the UN needs to be strengthened to follow, uh, for instance, you know, the policies of UN aviators, including some of the tricky questions, the ethical questions, how, what are we doing with the data when we're flying over, over refugee camps and so forth. So there is a lot of work to do. And uh, so we are, uh, of course, happy that we can be part of this process. Uh, and uh, having the family together. We just had a meeting two weeks ago in New York where we were reviewing process, again, with the support of Sweden. Uh, so thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Daniel. And uh, we have already got some questions from, from you in the, in the audience. And if you, if you have further questions, you're welcome to write them down and that will be collected by our colleagues from USIP. Um, I have a question here to uh, Stephanie, but I think it can also be a question to, to all of you. And it has to do with uh, uh, the culture in our organizations, uh, company culture or organization culture. Uh, yeah, well, culture in organizations. And the question is, uh, can you speak about how senior DOD officials are learning about the social media to be used as a tool for stratcoms? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And first, actually, I just want to give credit where credit is due. The statistic that I mentioned earlier was from the peaceoperationsreview.org. So I just said that I would do that. Um, answer that question. It's, it's a little bit varied. Um, I, I convene a meeting with all of the digital leads for all the services and you know we're all kind of going through this process uh, as one and we all had different leaders and we all have different leaders in terms of their familiarity and comfortable comfort with uh, social media. So for example the Air Force, uh, no, sorry, excuse me, the Marines, in order to get the Commandant on social media they did a little experiment. Um, they had the Commandant sit down for a traditional Q&A where they asked him questions that were submitted by Marines and he answered the questions and then they put the full interview online. It was a 30 minute interview and it went online and then they decided that they were going to do something a little different. They were going to do a Facebook town hall and so they put the Commandant on the Marines Facebook page and they did a live Q&A session and they saw, you know, there were just huge differences in who was asking questions, what kinds of questions the Commandant was asking. What they found is that they were getting, uh, as I would say, a little bit more, less PC questions in the Facebook Town Hall. People were much more willing to ask the questions that were really on their mind versus in the sit-down Q&A where it was a very more, it was a form, more formal setting. You know, they, they were getting technical questions. You know, tell me about my pay, tell me about my benefits, right? But when they, when they put him on the Facebook town hall, he got questions about what if I have an alcohol, what if I have a DUI? How is that going to impact my service? You know, really like hard hitting questions. And so that got the commandant realizing that there were a lot of benefits to getting on social media. He does not have his own account at this time and he is now going to become the chairman of the Joint Chiefs who does have a Facebook page. So it would be very interesting to see if he takes over that page when he becomes the new chairman in the fall. Um, and then I think just lastly, you know, with, as I said earlier, just to harken back to what we did, you know, with the Secretary of Defense, we showed him stats, right? We found the, there was a, it was a 2014 Blue Star Families report that had all these numbers showcasing who's on Facebook. We asked our Twitter contacts, you know, who's on Twitter, right? We looked at where our, where our audience was, and that is how we convinced the Secretary that he should be involved. Um, I will say that I was not originally a fan of putting him on Facebook because it does require commitment from the host, right? It requires the, 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 the principal to be active and to want to engage. And so that's something that we're working on right now, trying to get him to be, you know, liking comments and responding to people. Um, and that'll just be something that we work on over the next few months. Oh, sorry. I was, was uh, um, the only thing I would say is there's two, uh, two additional points, which is making sure that use of digital media is included in everybody's performance reviews. 
uh, because uh, you know we as an organization, a medium-sized organization, everybody goes through the performance review process once a year and making sure that digital and use of digital media is part of their performance reviews has an amazing impact on people's willingness to use it. And I think the second element is from a generational perspective, you know, 90% of the people at the UN Foundation have it as part of their DNA, so you don't need to educate them. But for old people like me, you have to show somebody that use of digital media actually produces results. And so making sure that you do an internal storytelling, not just about number of impressions and how many people could have theoretically seen this, but what happened when uh, you know, a policymaker, uh, somebody in the media saw that digital trend and therefore it led to another level of either an advocacy action or a media exposure. And I think trying to help tell that internal story about the relationship between digital and then a broader message um, sometimes helps. Yeah, definitely. Daniel, would you also like to comment upon this question? Uh, no, not really. I mean, I'm also part of the older generation. <laughs> um, but it's, that is part of our struggle uh, to convince uh, my gov I cannot talk about the UN, but my government, Swiss government, uh, how difficult it is to get understanding uh, and uh, for this, you know, changing world. And it has to do that most of our decision makers have a certain age. It's just, and then they hear from their children, but how? You know, and, and the, the gene, the reaction, you know, the reflex. So I think we have to wait a few, a few years. Well, we have also got another question, a very practical uh, but still very important question on resources. And the question is, as a first step, what type of resources does the human need to take the frontier forward? What type of investments are we talking about in terms of human resources? financial resources and technical resources? And that's a question to all of you. Daniel, please. Actually, I don't think it takes much. Uh, it's just, you know, reprioritizing uh, the money uh, and give, you know, put the political will behind it to have staff, more staff, better trained staff who can master these challenges huh, from a strategic point of view or information management point of view. Uh, so that is uh, just reprioritizing staff and and have it as a generalized staffing. You know, for instance, uh, you know, uh, I mean, talk about more like maybe a humanitarian operation, but in Burma, you know, when they had a big uh, humanitarian crisis, you know, a lot of people, organization come in, OCHA and so with lots of resources and information management. And then when the crisis goes down and then everybody's gone and then there's nobody there. And you know, when it's a new crisis, then you have to build up the data architecture, the capabilities. So we need also permanent, permanent staffing in, and we're talking to the UNDP now and the resident coordinators, to have a minimum you know, uh, of capability in, in. Now, the other one is technology. The technology, as we said, is very fast moving and it's not costly anymore, but you have to have somebody who can really handle it. And ideally, uh, you mentioned uh, Lebanon. I, th I think they have a very strong uh, capabilities there, but not everywhere. So there is needs to be built in uh, some new capabilities kind of a lab, you know, some people who understand these technologies and, and are part of the mission. Um, that's my recommendation, but in terms of resources, it doesn't cost very much. I would agree. The only thing I would say is, to echo your point, which is, you know, the, the digital media person needs to, it not, it, it can't be their secondary responsibilities. You need to make sure that your, op your media and outreach operation has somebody whose sole job it is to do digital, and if you don't, it will always be somebody's second priority. Yeah, I would just add that I agree. It doesn't take much. I mean, the beauty of social media is that it is social, and the idea is that if you have a good piece of content, your audience will share it. Um, in my previous uh, role at the Truman Project, we had a minuscule budget, and I think I spent maybe 
you know, like I had a campaign where we spent $5 a week for a month, and that was like the budget, you know? And we still saw gains, because if you are strategic about how you're spending that money, if you are using the right hashtags, if, you are, if you're putting it out at the right time, if you're targeting it at the right people, you could, a dollar can go a long way. At the DOD, we do not have a paid strategy. It is all earned. And so we really have to think strategically about when are we posting, what are we posting about, who are we tagging, who are we talking to, and what content are we sharing. And so it's a combination of those things, but you really can go far with, with not a lot. I have also another question to you, Stephanie, and the question is as follows. How do you deal with the problem that military cannot or are not allowed to tweet practically does everybody have to become a communicator? I'm sorry, that they can't tweet? What was the, that yeah, the military yeah. cannot tweet? That, that was the, uh, the question. Well, I'm not ex I think what they're asking is um, if you are not familiar with the platform but you're being put on it, I'm going to kind of go in that direction. Um, I think that, yes, at some level, uh, in your, you know, you do have to understand how to communicate. But if you are a policy expert, I would hope that you can communicate on your issue. Um, and what that means, though, is just finding um, maybe a less wonky way to communicate, right? So I always try to think story first. You know, give examples. Um, behind the scenes uh, pictures always do well on social media, right? So if you are about to go, you know, s go speak at an event or you're going to travel somewhere really cool, you know, don't necessarily just focus on the speech, but focus on what is happening. So a great example of that is um, the secretary traveled to Singapore recently and was on an Osprey where he flew over the Malacca Straits to see the economic activity that was going on. And of course, that's a, that's a pretty cool photo, but it was going to be hard for us to explain that. Um, so what we did instead is we contacted the literal combat ship Fort Worth, which is a ship stationed on the Malacca Straits, and we asked them, can you make a video one minute long of your sailors explaining why is it important for you to be here? And so they gave us a two-minute video showcasing three of their sailors talking about why it was important for them to be in the Malacca Straits. And that video did so much better than if we had had the secretary try to explain, I'm here at the Malacca Straits and it's important, right? So I think that there are different ways for you to communicate. It doesn't always have to be through you. You can showcase other people's work. Um, we tend to use, especially for the secretary's page, we use the social media strategy. It's called the rule of thirds. So one third of our content is original content from the secretary's page. One third of our content is shared content from DOD channels. And then a third of our content is content from people, like-minded individuals to the secretary. And that strategy helps us kind of showcase his priorities, but also uh, amplifies what DOD is doing writ large. Thank you, Stephanie. Well, I would like to finish by putting a, a question uh, myself. And let's think a little bit out of the box. Uh, Next year, we will get a new Secretary General. And let's think that he or she decides to appoint an Under Secretary General responsible for communication and public affairs. And you are the person. So my question to you is, what should be your first decision and advice to the new Secretary General when it comes to communication and public affairs? As the new appointed Under Secretary General, Daniel. Well, I would, um, I, would, I would ask him finally, I mean, he has, of course, had, you know, it's his strategy, the crisis information management strategy, which could include all these components. But I think he should really put his weight behind it, you know, uh, and he can do quite a lot. Uh, I think that's what, and we could refer to this report, huh? The, which I mentioned, and so forth. So that's what I, what I want to do. And then go to some countries, member states, who uh, will support him and say, yes, you're doing a good job. We'll support you all the way. So that's what I would recommend. Thank you, Daniel. <laughs> Peter. Uh, well, when she is sworn in as a, the <laughs> next Secretary General, because <laughs> uh, I will be, sh be shocked if it's not a woman. <laughs> because there are plenty of qualified women in this world to be Secretary General of the United Nations. So when she is sworn in, um, my suggestion is, is that my advice to her new Under Secretary General for Public Information and Communications will be to get the digital communications teams, like Stephanie, uh, from the member states 
to come brief the team there and give them advice about here are the top five or six things that you need to be doing within the UN system and work with them for a few weeks on a little bit of a detail. So I would say uh, there's so much wealth of talent among uh, member states uh, uh, and they should be asked to offer it to the UN. Thank you, Peter. And Stephanie. Mm -hmm. I would do obviously an assessment of the digital communications, uh, I guess, capabilities and I would identify where the gaps are and then I would ask for a budget to fill those gaps. So whether or not that means hiring a graphic designer, whether or not that means hiring a social media strategist, or whether or not that means creating a budget for a paid strategy, that's what I would do. Excellent. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Peter. And thank you, Stephanie. And please join me in a big hand to our excellent panel.